Why am I talking at you? I have a story to tell, and it's kind of centered around these three ideas. Now, is anyone not familiar with imposter syndrome? Okay, so it's this idea or this sensation, or even a, a paranoia or anxiety at some times of um, feeling like you didn't earn your place, that your successes are not yours, and that you don't, um, that, you know, you, you might even have this anxiety that people are going to find out that you're actually incompetent and you're going to lose your job and such. And if you're not an arrogant whole of your favorite metaphorical variety, then you probably suffer this to some degree. And, and it's a very common thing, and that's okay. I mean, I think it's good to feel this way as long as it doesn't keep you from doing useful things and applying yourself, which comes to synthesis. Um, how many of you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Um, if, you've, if you've read anything about pedagogy, then you've probably heard of it. It's this uh, categorization of, of educational goals with simple things like uh, memorization and um, understanding concepts at the bottom, and harder concepts like uh, a analyzing and critiquing and synthesizing new ideas at the top. And all too often, we forget that we can do these things at the top. You know, we forget that we can make new ideas. Um, you know, we, we can do more than just Google answers and, you know, copy-paste. And I think it's really important to do. And I think Py Python is a really great place for, for playing with these ideas. So um, my story kind of revolves around a machine learning project that I worked on uh, at People's Post. But to kind of get context around that work, I'd like to really quickly talk about where I came from. So who am I? Uh, I'm trained as a physicist. As an undergrad, I worked on this project. It's a crazy idea where they cut a hatch in, a, in the side of a 747 and stuck a telescope in there and fly this above atmospheric moisture so you can get really nice infrared images this way. Uh, and I wrote the, the data reduction pipeline for this um, when I was an undergrad. And that sounds all fancy, but really I just sat in a windowless, windowless lab in front of a computer, not really knowing what I was doing, just doing what I was told. Um, but I learned some good uh, programming fundamentals that way, um, like just the, the bare basics. Uh, and and yeah, and eventually undergrad ended. Um, I did a useless master's degree in material science, and then eventually went on to uh, a PhD program in physics. And I was an experimentalist, so this is my lab. And on the left, you see my experiment. It's this mess of cables and electronics and this pipe. You see this pipe going off the edge of the table, and that was our vacuum chamber. It's a pipe. We stuck a vacuum pump on it. Anyway, uh, this whole thing, like all of these cables coming into it, all the, the electronics, there's a bunch of stuff not even in the picture, was um, in support of, of this little microscope thing on the right. And it, it's not your typical optical microscopy. It's a force probe microscopy. So the actual active element is this tiny dot here. And that thing leading up to it is an optical fiber which senses the sensor. So it's a lot of really tiny stuff. Tiny things are fragile. Fragile things break, and things break a lot when they're made by graduate students because, by definition, graduate students don't know what they're doing, right? Because if they knew, they wouldn't be students. Um, who, who's seen this demo in physics class where you, you drop a tennis ball in, on top of a basketball, and, uh, and it goes sh shooting super high? It's like kind of unexpected. It's fun. Uh, it's, it's fun to do. And you do it, and you kind of, well, this is how physics sort of treated me. I mean, it's gorgeous, it's, it's wonderful, but then you, it hurts you sometimes. And, and so, let's see, after I finished my, my doctorate, I decided I'll try something new. Somehow, I ended up in, in data science. I'm just going to let that loop because it's hilarious. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I ended up in data science, um, moved out here, got a job at Bitly, uh, worked there for almost a year um, before I found myself at Paperless Post, which is where I am now. And if you're not familiar with Paperless Post, we do online and paper invitations and greeting cards. And um, we, we differentiate ourselves by having just gorgeous, gorgeous design. We have a, a team of in-house designers who are um, just amazing at what they do. And the, the styles range from you know, the, the very pretty to the, the whimsical. We have a few um, design partners who do things like the one on the, the upper middle or some handsome stationery in the bottom. We also have a paper product, which I know, paperless post, but um, the paper product came after. And, and yeah, it's, it's surprisingly economical for the quality that you get. 
Um, but okay, so I'm here at a reasonably successful um, company that's growing at a rapid clip, and I have, you know, this this great role as data science or data scientist. Um, so what is it like? So at this point, I want to talk about a project that I work on to kind of illustrate the way that I like to approach the problems that I get. So the problem is, let's cluster our users. You know, we have all these users. We want to know more about them. Like who, who, who are, or what, what kinds of users are using our site? And these are the standard solutions. And my, my students probably recognize this, uh, this chart. It's from the scikit-learn docs. And these are your standard clustering solutions. And you can see that for these different artificial data sets, different ones perform differently. Um, but it, it's a little bit problematic in this sort of problem because for most of these, if you ask for clusters, you will get clusters. It doesn't matter whether they are actually there. Um, you also, in a lot of cases, need clearly differentiable um, uh, groupings of, of data. And you don't always have that. Um, most of the real world data that you see um, especially in, in something like a retail space, you're, you're going to see a lot of data at zero, and then a little bit at one, and then a whole huge long tail of, of the, the mighty followers. Um, and these don't cluster so well. So I found myself spending time trying to make new features that would be differentiable. And, um, and I realized I forgot what the question was. Right? I was starting with the answer at that point and trying to build features to give me the answer that I wanted. And that's not, um, that's not what science is. So what was the question again? The question was, how do our users actually use the site? So I wanted to make something that could reveal you know, un un unknown actions, unknown kinds of, uh, or patterns of use. <clears throat> so I took a step back and kind of slowly, one by one, a few ideas uh, popped into mind, and I started to think about how they're, they're kind of related. And the first sort of tangent that I want to talk about um, is this problem of sequence alignment. In, in bioinformatics, you have uh, gene sequences uh, from maybe two different individuals, and you'll have uh, mutations or, or just variations in these things. So you want to be able to take uh, two, two uh, gene sequences that may not be terminated at the same points, and find out where they overlap the most so that you can identify, you know, these are the common ones between the two, and, and these are the genes that are, are um, just different. And there are lots of uh, standard algorithms for approaching this problem. Uh, the other tangent uh, that kind of came to mind uh, was this um, data structure called a disjoint set data structure, or union find data structure. Uh, and the idea is you have these nodes, eight nodes on the left, and you can start unioning them or grouping them into larger sets. And then it becomes very easy to look up whether two items uh, are in the same set or not. And if you apply it to something like a percolation problem where you have um, this, this matrix of points, well, you can consider each square as a node, um, and then uh, set this up as, as this data set and union all of the squares that are connected to each other, you can very, very quickly find whether there is a path from uh, one square to another, so sort of solving the maze. Um, and then I recalled a talk that um, a former colleague of mine, well, I say former colleague, but we only overlap by two weeks, uh, but Mike Dewar uh, at the New York Times uh, gave this talk, um, and I, I encourage you to watch the video because it's, it's, it's a really great video. Um, and he showed this visualization that they had done there um, with these 14 clusters representing different types of uh, user sessions. So people coming to the site performing certain actions and then leaving. And then the different colors represent the different kind of pages that they visited. And each row within each cluster is a session. So you see the, the long, skinny uh, red, blue, and gray stripes. And those are people just doing that one thing and then leaving. And then some of the rows, you see these very long stripes that start, I mean, it's hard to see in this image, but start maybe with um, doing the red action and then the, the gray action a ton of times um, and then leaving. And that's um, and I thought this was a really nice way of, of seeing um, not only the different types of actions that people are, are, are doing or, or the t types of interactions that people engage in, um, but also sort of the velocity. Because if you, if you go to the video, this actually moves and it scrolls. Um, and you can see that some of these scroll much, much faster than others. And so you kind of get a sense of, of the volume of each of these different categories. Uh, so putting this all together, 
<clears throat> I thought, maybe I'll do this. So instead of asking, you know, can I group users by these properties, these aggregate properties, like how much money have they spent, how many cards have they sent, maybe I can uh, assemble something that resembling a DNA snippet, where each character represents a particular action. So creating a card, or sending a card, or uh, purchasing uh, online coins and such. From that, then I can calculate edit distances between different users' um, snippets, uh, and then use UnionFind to kind of hierarchically cluster these together into clusters. <clears throat> um, so I started with doing this, um, this, this snippet building, and this is just uh, a visualization. This is just alphabetically sorted, which is meaningless, but it does group certain similar things together. Uh, and you see that there is some structure that we as humans can pick out. Like there's, uh, oh, you can't see the mouse, but um, there's a, the light blue uh, clusters of, of, of people who've, not clusters, um, you, you see this light blue band where, oh, I'm sorry, uh, every column of pixels here is a user. And every color represents a particular kind of action. And these are the, just the most recent 100 activities, actions, with the most recent action at the top. So that thin stripe at the top are the, the folks who've only created a card and have done nothing else. Um, and at the bottom, you see people who've alternated between light blue and dark blue. So that's people who've alternated between creating cards and sending cards and creating another one, sending again. Uh, and then you see this dark blue uh, patch of people who've uh, created a card, maybe bought some coins, and then sent that card multiple times to other people. Um, so my first go at it was using a, something called the, the Levenstein edit distance, which some of you I, I see are familiar with. Um, I didn't expect it to work well. It didn't. Um, and that's fine. I, I just wanted to um, start to get an intuition for how this might work. Um, and what I kind of realized from that was that edit distances aren't going to do well because I want the, the single action folks to, to, I want to recognize them as similar to the, the folks who've um, created but haven't sent you know, 10 or 20 cards. And an edit distance wasn't going to give me that. So I tried a weighted jacquard, jacquard index. Um, a standard jacquard index is um, a measure of the similarity between two sets. So you, you take the cardinality of the intersection of two sets over the cardinality of the union of the two, and that tells you how similar they are. If your sets are identical, then the intersection and the union are the same, so you, it equals one. If they're totally disjoint, then you get zero. Um, and then it's fairly straightforward to ex extend this into a weighted jacquard, um, because uh, if I go back, um, you can see that there are these tiny little red points, and that's the folks who are creating and purchasing uh, print orders, so paper orders. Uh, and you can see that's much more rare. So of course I want to weight those events more, uh, more, much more strongly. So I, I wanted to um, include this, so thus weighted jacquard, and I, I won't really get into how that works, but um, I can explain it a little later. Um, and this, this sounded promising, but it just it, it didn't work. I got uh, eight clusters with barely anyone in them, and then these two huge ones, I mean, they go off longer, I just gave you a, a cut of it. Um, it's two huge ones that are indistinguishable. Like they, they have all kinds of users in them. So that wasn't working. Um, <clears throat> so then I started to think, maybe, maybe I can do uh, TFIDF weighting. Maybe instead of thinking of each snippet as an individual string, maybe I can think of it as a document, where each character um, would be analogous to a word in, in your typical NLP problem. Um, and then you can, um, you can treat each character sort of like a word and build these character n-grams and, and do this TFIDF vectorization um, to expand each snippet into this multidimensional space with as many dimensions as you have possible um, n-grams, I guess. Um, and from these vectors, you can calculate a, a cosine distance, a cosine similarity. So if, if two of these vectors are pointing more in the same direction, you'll have a, a larger positive score. And if they're um, pointing tangential to each other, tangential? Uh, perpendicular to each other, then, um, then you, you'll get zero, and, and, and so on. So this is a very different way of, 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 of interpreting this problem. And it actually turned out to work pretty well. So I got five clusters. Well, I mean, I could have gotten as many as I wanted. But um, I, I chose five clusters, and they look like this. I mean, this one has a lot of the red in it. So these are the folks who uh, purchased paper. 
This one, it's hard to tell, but there's a lot of yellow in there. So these are the people whose actions, um, who, who, for whom coin purchases represent a significant part of their activity. Um, and then you have this cluster that has a lot of light blue. So these are the people who are making a lot of drafts and then sending relatively few cards. This is the opposite, people who are uh, making relatively few drafts, but then sending it multiple times. Um, these are the people who alternate. So create, send, create, send. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, I was pretty pleased. I mean, it looks like it's working. And, um, and this isn't a finished product, of course. There are a lot of places to take it. I mean, I've only included five types of actions here, but you can imagine putting many more. Um, and uh, asking other questions, using this as a tool to answer or to ask other questions and investigate uh, new things. Um, so coming back to this question of what's it like to to be where I am in this place, I think it's it's great because it's there are a lot of places to synthesize new ideas, to take the things that you know from wherever you happen to read these things. And mind you, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. I haven't studied bioinformatics. I just read about it at some point. Took some NLP class online and then. This came up in the union file. Like I, I couldn't have implemented that on my own. I just read about it at some point and remembered to look it up. And we forget sometimes that we're allowed to to play with things that we don't know very well. Like it's okay to 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 take non-standard approaches to the problems that you're facing. And I, I really encourage you to do that. And it's it's scary to do because it looks like. I mean, it, it looks like the, the people that we look up to, the celebrities in our spaces, in our relative spaces, they know so much compared to us. You know, they have this vast amount of knowledge and experience, and we have this, this little bit of it. But in reality, knowledge is pretty fuzzy. There are things that you know better or, than other things. Like, you know, the things that you know, you know, some things you know very well, some things you're a little bit fuzzy on. And it, it's the same with the, the people you look, look, look up to. Um, and knowledge isn't just this one big amorphous thing. There's uh, different domains of knowledge that you might have more or less experience in. So it, it looks like you know you have so little knowledge compared to them, but that's because you can only you're, you're comparing this tiny bit of overlap that you have with them with the rest of theirs, and ignoring the fact that you know all of this other stuff that may not have immediate um, uh, relevancy to to the problems that you're you're tackling, but um, but with a bit of, of creativity and a bit of pushing, I guess, you can, you can make it work. And I think Python is a really great place for, for doing this sort of free exploration because you know, the syntax and the semantics are so, so friendly. And I didn't say perfect, but friendly. So you can really iterate on things very quickly. And there's so many communities within Python working on very specific problems that a lot of work has been done that's well documented with communities behind them that you can uh, use uh, to, to support the work that you want to do or to explore new directions that you want to go. Um, so for my closing note, I just want to say you, you hear a lot of what I consider bad advice, like move fast and break things. People tend to get mad when you break things. So <laughs> you, you don't want to break things just because you can. And uh, fail fast, well, the point isn't really to fail. It's, it's to be not afraid of failure and to frame things not as failure but as, as learning. Uh, the whole point of science and, and discovery is that you don't know the answer. So you have to try things to get to the answer. Um, so if you're not thinking and if you're not creating, if you're not making things and trying things, that's failure because then you're not moving anywhere. You're not, you're not making yourself useful and you don't, you don't have to be perfect to be useful because no one is perfect. No one knows everything. Knowledge changes. Tools change. New things sprout up all the time. So no one knows everything. Everyone starts from somewhere. Everyone starts from complete ignorance. So it's never too late to catch up. And that's my message. Um, this is me. You can follow me on Twitter, but you might be disappointed. Um, and uh, jobs, thank you. Yeah, so five is fairly arbitrary. Um, 
for purposes of the talk, I didn't want to have 20 clusters to go through and explain. And at five clusters, they, they, seem to, they seem to separate well into five where each had a distinct character. Um, so yeah, it, it's completely arbitrary. And for, for a real scenario, I would want to include many more actions, which would derive many, many more kinds of clusters. So um, yeah, thanks. Yes? Uh, sure. So the, the question is, wouldn't it make sense to, to separate these very long users, users with longer history from the shorter ones? And um, yeah, there's an argument to be made there. Um, for, for the question I wanted to answer, I, wasn't, I didn't want to penalize um, users for having only been a member for a week. You know, so I, I, I wanted to be able to say, this user is likely to be similar to this other user who's been around for 100 times as long. Um, so I, I didn't want to separate them manually. But for, for a, to, to ask other kinds of questions, it may make sense to do that. Yeah, so um, identifying users whose, whose growth has, um, I guess, who, who have been grow growing over time. Um, yeah, so there's a temporal component here that's very lacking. There's, there's only sort of an ordinal sense of these actions happened before these other ones, but no sense of um, the, the interval of time between these actions. And that, yeah, that's definitely a limitation of this model. But, um, it wasn't clear to me how to incorporate that here right now as a first go at it. Um, but yeah, it's a different kind of question that would be worth answering. Yes, uh, Venus. How long um, the model Yeah. Um, so for me, the way that I approach problems like this, I would spend as much time as I need to get a proof of concept, just to demonstrate that this thing is even possible. and to, to be able to illustrate what you can do with it. Um, then I, I present it to the people, you know, the decision makers in the company and see if this is an avenue worth exploring for them. Like, is this question even um, interesting to them? Um, and then, yeah, then resources get allocated thereafter. Thanks. Uh, ben, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious where the, uh, where the questions come from. Oh. Uh, is it sort of you and your team Up with them yourself is like let's think about our customers and users. Right. Or does it usually come from sort of the decision makers, executives, sort of few questions and then come back and sort of the mm -hmm. So where do questions come from? And I would say all of those places. Um, a lot of times it does come from the the decision makers. They they have a very particular goal in mind. Or um, sometimes, I mean. It's not the best way to do it, but sometimes I do have like a little algorithm or data structure that I really want to play with, and I kind of invent a scenario where it might be useful. Um, but other times, it's, it's it's also our own imaginations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.